Uh, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Baptist. We are glad that you're here today as we are now in our sixth week about out outreach and thinking our way through it. I want to make sure that we understand that no amount of persuading or arguing or manipulating will save anyone. It's only going to be God. God saves. He saves by grace through faith, faith in Jesus Christ and in the facts of the gospel. That means we must be praying. That means we must take our carrying the message of the gospel to the Lord in prayer and ask God for boldness and for opportunities and for clarity. But that also means we must pray for the people who are hearing the message that God opens their heart as well. There is actually more encouragement in the Bible about praying for those who are sharing the gospel than about the lost themselves. That's really intriguing to me. Uh, it, it doesn't mean we don't pray for the lost. It just means that, that we need to be praying for our own hearts because we can't change their hearts. Only God does that. So we're talking about praying for outreach this morning and we'll be developing that as we go along. Let's open with our hymnals. Hymn number 111. 111, just the amazing thought that God loves me. 111, let's stand as we sing. <laughs> Yeah. 
106. 106. it love and that's what makes it grace is that you reach down to us to save lost people like us thank you for Jesus and sending him and showing your love through him the way he lived and the way he died in our place thank you for showing your power through him the power of your love and raising from the, him from the dead and father this morning we pray we ask you for your own work in our lives as we worship you as we point out how wonderful you are and then as we respond to it bring in our request to you and understanding that you do love us and care for us and want to answer our prayers i pray we'd come boldly i pray we'd come often i pray that we would come trusting you in your care for us and trusting you and your care for the people that we love and we want to share Christ with. I pray that you would encourage us today. We ask for those who are not able to be here. Many of our folks are traveling and I ask for your safety. I pray that they would be a blessing as they attend other churches this morning, as they are around other people. I pray that you would help them to be testimonies, mouthpieces for you pray for those who are not feeling well, not able to be here. I pray you would encourage them and give them strength and give them an understanding of your love for them as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So noon today is our Vacation Bible School meeting. I know there are several of our crew that are not going to be able to be here but let's plan on meeting at noon and we will just be updated. The, the curriculum came and it'll be fun to go through. It's always fun to, to open that Christmas box and to go through all of the, the information that's there. Again, this is week six out of nine and we're focusing on praying for outreach this morning. Sunday school was helpful and thinking through how do we pray 
this morning. I pray that it would be helpful to you as well as we go through several passages speaking of our prayers for the lost. Um, I would encourage you to go through your devotionals this week. Uh, the devotionals are out of Colossians chapter 4, and then, if at all possible, to be involved in the Bible studies either this afternoon or on Wednesday evening. And we are going through 1 Timothy chapter 2 in those Bible studies. You see some announcements coming up. Um, nothing pressing, but just understand that Pastor will be going to Pennsylvania for Shepherd's Haven in March. Easter will be here before we know it, the end of March. Be inviting people to that morning. We'll have more details about the scheduling soon. And Pastor will be going to New York for the Northeast Regular Baptist Fellowship Conference in the first part of April. Missionaries that weekend, the 7th. Nathan will be here the 14th. And then there is information on the bulletin board in the back of the Striving for the Mastery Conference in North Conway, which is early May. So several uh, announcement related things. Would encourage you to check on the bulletin board in the back for signing up for church cleaning. That's on the big calendar. And then signing up for snow shoveling. Uh, understand that Parker's have their name up there on the calendar for snow shoveling and then if they don't do it, pastor arrives here and pastor does it. So I don't mind that, but if you are able to fill in taking those responsibilities, we'd love for you to be involved in that. Randy. Yep, on uh, the BPS meeting, I just wanted to get the materials and the right in, so like, we don't even have to be downstairs. Okay. It's, it's in a box here in the back. So especially if you are a teacher or are crafts or are um, yeah, activities type of things, food, um, there are different pieces of that puzzle that go to you. If you're in charge of a department, if you're the teacher of a certain age group, um, the information's back there and we'll divide that up. I just want to thank everybody for the prayers and the cards uh, during my Really yes, Nancy's had breathing problems and respiratory issues, and we're glad that she's able to be back with us this morning. Glad Herman's here, and make sure you greet him and wish him a happy birthday. And what is that, Herman? 110 this year? <laughs> Ninety, ninety-one, ninety-one. So, so great, Herman, this morning. Okay, ushers, come, please. We'll receive our offering. Our missionaries this week are the Marshfields. Dale's task is to go into India, particularly, but then he has other places where he's doing seminary-level training of theological issues. And then our sister church is First Baptist Church in Harrington, Maine. Let's pray. Father, I pray for our friends in Harrington as they worship you at this moment. I pray for the word to be clear. I pray for their worship to be acceptable. I pray for their obedience to be in line with what they are taught from the word of God this week. I pray for the Marshfields as they, in the next two years, try to wrap up their ministry publicly as Dale hands off piece by piece the, the responsibilities that he's had as he makes arrangements relating to, to the different cohorts and the places where the training is happening in India. I pray that those would all be able to hand it off to the Indian believers and that the effectiveness of this program would keep going on of training people who are serving you faithfully. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you here in North Jay. I pray that we would be making disciples, that we would be looking for opportunities for gospel witness, that we'd not only be knocking on doors, but trying them to see if they're open. 
and being bold and clear in our, in our testimony of the gospel. I pray for our, this offering as we give it to you and to your work. I pray for it to be used for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name what a glorious testimony that anybody would have if Christ has saved them would encourage you to take your copy of God's word this is God speaking to us turn to the book of 1st Timothy chapter 2 for our scripture reading 1st Timothy chapter 2 and I'm going to have Joe come and we'll read starting in verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Good morning. Good morning. Reading from the book of Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. <clears throat> This passage is actually going to be our Bible study this week, so we will cover that this afternoon as well as Wednesday evening, but it's, we will look at it again briefly in a few minutes this morning. Uh, praying for all men, why? So that we can have a quiet and peaceable life. It is at the end of the story though. It, you see, sometimes we just say, I'm going to pray in our nation that we have a quiet and peaceful life. Just leave me alone. But that isn't the thing at all. The thing is that Christ died for all. He gave himself a ransom for all. And the quiet and peaceable life is so that we would have opportunities to share the gospel. And, and that is very crucial for us in our thought processes as we pray for our government, as we pray for those in authority, and as we pray for all men. I would invite you to take your hymnals again, turn to hymn number 342. 342. The great news that Jesus saves. And I'm sorry, we're going to have to stand. This is a one you need your breath for. <laughs> Her 
26, 526. <laughs> your testimony, that you are truly glad because Christ has been working in your heart. We will be in several different passages this morning. The first one you can be turning to is the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3. It'll be a few minutes before we get there. 1 Timothy 2 that we had read a few minutes ago told us to pray for all men, particularly those in authority, kings, and for everyone in authority. The prayer for all men is general, pray for them, and then the prayer for those in authority is so that we could live a quiet and peaceable life. But the quiet and peaceful and dignified and godly life is not just so we get to do what we want. It is for the purpose of having open doors for the gospel, to share the gospel with as many people as possible. First uh, Timothy 2, 4 said, God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And as I mentioned, our Bible studies this week will open First Timothy 2 in more depth. These next few minutes, though, we will be looking at several passages, passages that encourage us to pray. Uh, the specific verse about how to pray specifically, so a specific verse to pray specifically for the lost, um, you won't find it to, to say, here's the very words to pray uh, about the lost. However, there are tons of places where prayer is talked about. And there are principles for us as we think about how and what to pray for the lost. We know that we need to pray because only God saves. Since only God saves, he's the one that has to do the work, and we're going to ask him to be involved. We know what to pray by seeing what is important to God. Um, I'll, I'll just go back to the farm for an illustration. Working with dad two or three hours in the morning before we go to school and two or three hours after school before we go to bed all day on Saturday <clears throat> as briefly as possible Sunday, but it was still two or three hours in the morning and two or three hours in the evening. You got to know what dad had in mind about the farm. So you got to know a little bit about what to ask him. The cows need hay in the, in the pasture feeder. Do I take the hay out of this mow or out of that mow? You, you see how they, I didn't have to ask dad if he wanted the cows to be fed. Yeah, I just had to ask him which, which place do I go? And 
we don't have to ask God if we should share the gospel or not. We already know that. So we're asking God relating to, to knowing who to talk to today, the open doors that are going to be there, that God's going to be opening for us, how, how to knock on the door in such a way that people will answer, and, so to speak, you know, figuratively speaking, and then being bold to speak and knowing the words to say. When we know something is important to God, we know it is his will. So going back to the farm, I know God wants the pasture feeder filled with hay. I know God wants something relating to evangelism. So when dad wants something, I, I know I'm going to head that direction. When God wants something, I know I'm going to head that direction. What is God's will? I need to pray for God's will to be done in evangelism. And here's a stupid question. I'm going to ask it anyway. What does God want for lost people? He wants them to be saved. Uh, it, it says so in 1 Timothy 2 that we read. Does God care for all lost people or only a few? No, he, he cares for everybody. What does the Lord want for lost people? He wants them to be saved. What is our tendency? And again, are we praying for God's will? Or are we praying for something relating to how we think? What do we often think relating to the murder or the child sexual abuser? Lock them up, lock them up, and we start chanting. Is that God's heart for the lost? Or is God's heart for the lost to save them and forgive them and change them? You, you see how that changes the way we pray? So Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3. We ourselves were sometimes at one time foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Oh, that doesn't apply to me, does it? No, no, that, that was us. That was me living this way. In fact, I still prove that, that I have remnants of this filth in me because I sometimes still live this way. But, verse 4, after the kindness and love of, our God, of God our Savior toward man appeared, how did God's love and kindness appear? Jesus came. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, therefore being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God showed his heart to us through sending Jesus. So we're just... As you think about praying for lost people, think about what the Lord's heart is towards lost people. Compassion and kindness and mercy. Have I absorbed some of this compassion and kindness and mercy? Or am I still a judgmental, harsh, lock them up kind of a person? Am I looking for, for the lost to receive the just due for their sin? Or am I looking for God to extend kindness into their life? What would the lost person that I work with say about me? What would they say my heart is towards them? So not only the kindness, but what about God's self-sacrificing love? And we know these verses, I'll just quote verses that we know, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. First John chapter 4, verse 10, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sin. We have seen and testified that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. This is God's heart, seen through his self-sacrificing love for us. 
What is God's heart for the lost? Compassion and love. What do people see in us? What do our prayers reflect? Do our prayers reflect, you God, you need to fix them because they're, they're making life annoying to me. No, I'm self-sacrificing love. And then back to 1 Timothy 2, we will look at this just a little bit more. 1 Timothy chapter 2, where in verse 4 we are told, God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is God's heart. He has a passionate desire to save. This is his passion. You ever know somebody that had a passion for something? Uh, a few people went fishing yesterday. And they have a passion to go fishing. Out in the cold, in the wind. That's passionate. But well, God's passion is to save the lost. And if we have that heart that God has, how will we pray? We'll pray that we would have opportunities to share the gospel with them. That's the only hope that they would have. And that God would change their hearts. Another aspect of God's will is not only his heart. What, where is God aimed in his heart? But another way to see God's will is his, his sacrifice. What did Jesus die to accomplish? You ever see somebody work like crazy for year after year on something? And you say, what are they trying to do? And you never do figure out what they're trying to do. But they're pouring an awful lot of energy into something. Well, God in his love and his kindness sent Jesus to die for a purpose. There was something behind that. Christ's sacrifice for us, here in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Have you ever had to separate people? So, say as a parent, you have to step in between them, or, or watch a football game, and you watch those little refs come in between these 300-pound guys, and, and you say, man, oh man, you have more guts than I have. And, and man has been separated from God. We're enemies. And Jesus comes between us as the mediator. Why? In order to save us. Verse 6, he gave himself a ransom for all. The payment that was due to be testified in due time. So Christ came for the purpose of saving the lost. Luke 19.10, we'll get there somewhere, hopefully later this year, as we go through the Gospel of Luke. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That was his purpose for coming. That was his heart for us. Revelation 5, 1, verse 5, to him that loved us and washed our sins in his blood. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we could go on and on with verses that show that Jesus came to die for us, for sinners, for lost people. That's the Lord's heart for us. So what does God want for the lost? He wants them to be saved. So how should we pray? Well, that's easy, isn't it? Now, how do we often pray? Or punish them. Well, get rid of them. They're, they're getting in my way. Sometimes we even try to spiritualize or make it sound godly by saying, they're getting in the way of the gospel. I'm trying to reach this other person with the gospel, and that person's getting in my way. And we, we pray rather than in kindness and mercy and love and self-sacrifice. We're, we're praying in ways that are not God's heart for the lost. Again, we can't save them. We can't change them. We are not their hope. Only God is their hope. So we pray. We pray that God's work would accomplish their salvation. God's work in their hearts, but God's work through us. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. 
God, you're my only hope, and you're the only hope for my loved ones and these people that I work with and my neighbors. You're the only hope for the lost. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Um, these are verses that we looked at in Sunday school, but they are helpful ones. Matthew chapter 9. As we think about how to pray for outreach, how do we pray for gospel outreach? First, we pray for the Lord's will. The Lord's will is that people get saved. So we pray in that direction. But here in Matthew chapter 9, we'll start with verse 36. Matthew 9, 36. When he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Then we see God's heart, don't we? Because they were fainted and were, as, were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So pray for the Lord's will, but also pray for the Lord's workers. The Lord has workers to go into his harvest field, and Jesus gives the instruction to pray for them. As we look around, as we see lost people, pray that God would send somebody to go and share the gospel with them. Uh, I'm calling this part of, of this point, pray for the Lord's workers, pray for the supply of workers, pray that there be more workers to go. But notice what happens when we pray in this way. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Um, they prayed for laborers. He called unto him his twelve disciples and gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then he named them. My point is this, that often when we pray for workers, our name is attached to the answer. Lord, Lord, I need you to go and and have somebody to go and share the gospel with this person. And then God says, uh, here's your name. Delavan is on that answer to that prayer. And, and that's what happened as these disciples prayed for workers. It's interesting, Luke chapter 10, we saw this last year as we went through the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10 was a little different. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus had sent 70 out two by two to share the, the gospel, to preach. And then as they went, Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So often when we have prayed and we actually go out as the answer to prayer, we find out that we're still in way over our heads and we are praying for more workers, like Luke chapter 10 shows. So make sure we get the picture. Just put this all together so far. The Lord's heart for the lost is that they be saved. So we pray for the lost and we pray for workers to proclaim the gospel to them. As we're praying that God sends somebody to share the gospel with somebody, we find that our name is somehow attached to the answer that God gives. And then as we go and work and, and we share the gospel with somebody, we may still find, God, I need reinforcements here. I'm, I'm not getting through to this person or these people. God, you're going to have to bring somebody else to share the gospel as well. So we pray for reinforcements. We pray for more help. So are we absorbing the Lord's heart and are we praying for workers. Well, I think we've already hinted that possibly we've shared the gospel. And this is interesting because we've been hearing this in Sunday school as we've been sharing testimonies. That we share the gospel and God brings somebody from a different direction to share the gospel. From, from a different direction. And, and it goes back to what Paul had said. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So God is using different people in his harvest field to reap this harvest of souls. Now let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and this is all tied together. 
really with this praying for gospel outreach and the workers who are sharing the gospel. Um, we're praying that God supply workers, and then as we go as workers, we pray that God brings other people that would fill in the blanks that we're unable to fill. And in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 18, Ephesians 6, 18, Paul is wrapping up this section on what we call the spiritual armor, where he goes through a whole coat of armor, and, and just picture Paul is, is chained, probably a soldier on each side of him. He's looking over here, and he's seeing the helmet, and he's seeing the breastplate, and he's seeing all of these different parts of this soldier's army. And then he looks over here, and this guy's dressed the same way. And Paul is saying, you, you guys, you're up against spiritual battle. And you need to prepare yourself for this battle. But by the way, once you get the armor on, you're still on the losing side if God isn't coming to help you. So you need to pray. So in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, so Paul is praying, saying pray for, for everybody around you in a bunch of different ways and directions. Don't just get into a rod of, Lord, pray for all the missionaries. You, you got to think broader than that. God save the lost. You know, think more clearly than that. And notice how Paul is praying himself and how he wants them to pray in verse 19. Pray for me that utterance may be given to me. Well, what does that mean? What does that King James language mean? Pray that the words would be given to me. I need to know how to say this, that words may be given to me, and then notice the middle part of verse 19, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. I'm a prisoner. I'm still an ambassador for Christ, I'm representing him, but I'm a prisoner, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So here's a couple more points to our how to pray for the workers. Pray for the supply of workers. Pray for the clarity of the workers. And this is my clarity, but your clarity as well, and as we pray for each other. We're getting quite a prayer lesson in Sunday school about people that are praying for each other as we share the gospel. And we need to pray that, that the gospel is clear. Often we look at Paul and we say, well, he always knew what to say. Have you ever thought about somebody like that, that you thought, man, they always know just what to say. You ask them a question, trying to corner them, and they know just what to say. Well, sometimes we think of Paul that way, but. Verse 19 proves Paul didn't know what to say. He, he, he knows that God knows what to say, so he says, pray for me. Pray for clarity. Colossians chapter 4, um, he asks for prayer to make the gospel clear as he speaks. And we'll get to Colossians 4 in just a few minutes. So Paul wants the ability to speak the way God wants him to speak, the way he ought to speak, the end of verse 20. Do you pray to be able to think clearly and speak clearly as you share the gospel? That, that's a very good way to pray. Do you pray for others to think clearly and to speak clearly? Now back, verse 19, what else does he pray for? He prays for boldness, and he wants others to pray for him for boldness. Once again, we often think of Paul as fearless, but this proves that Paul had fears. And, and sometimes he didn't speak, probably as he ought to speak. He says, pray for me. Pray that I'd be bold. Why might Paul have been afraid? Because he's in prison, chained to soldiers. Why was he in prison, chained to soldiers? Because people didn't like it that he was sharing the gospel. So if he shares the gospel here, what will happen? We don't know. So we might be tempted to think, look, Paul, just lay low for a few months. If you lay low, keep your mouth shut. You may get out in a couple of months, and then you can share the gospel. But Paul says, no, God put me here. God opened the doors of the prison and let me walk into a prison. 
so that I could share the gospel. Okay, so just over a couple books to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, we've talked about the supply of workers and the clarity of the workers and the boldness of the workers. Um, that is also in this passage of Colossians 4, but there's one other point that I want us to see. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. <clears throat> With all praying for us, Pray also for us. The God would open to us a door for the word. The God would open a door of utterance, a door to share a word. That, that's the original word there. Utterance is a word. You ever say, can I have a word with you? That's what Paul was saying. The, that there would be an opening for the word. To speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Here we are in Colossians, also in prison, as he writes it. Verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. The point here is Paul is praying for opportunities for the workers. Paul's in prison. is thinking that very possibly God has a soldier who would be chained to him that needs to hear the gospel. And he's looking for an opening in the conversation. Well, if he's asking for an opening for the conversation, what does that probably mean? There has not been an opening yet to share the gospel. Paul didn't just go in and blurt out everything without thinking or without waiting for this opening for the gospel. This was a careful sharing of the gospel. I want you to think about these two statements. Just make a distinction between these two statements. Number one, pray that I make opportunities for the gospel. Or number two, pray that I take opportunities for the gospel. You see the distinction? Make them or take them. Paul in verse 3 seems to be asking that God would open this door for the word. Now, I want to make sure we understand when God opens the door, Paul wants to be ready, he wants to be clear, and he wants to be bold when God opens the door. But again, I want to be clear about this. If you ever gone and knocked on a door and somebody yells from inside, the door is open! Think about that. If you're waiting, standing at the door, waiting for it to open for you, Maybe you're waiting for the wrong thing. If the door's locked, that's one thing. But often locked doors you can knock and people will open them. And, and why did people open them? Because God had them open them. But, but you knocked. So don't take this to mean that you don't knock on the door. You don't look for opportunities. What we're saying is that you don't use the crowbar to open the door. Years ago, Betsy and I were house-sitting for my aunt and uncle while they went to Africa, back to Africa after retirement to, to visit again, where they'd spent 40 years serving the Lord. But while we're there, I'm at work one day, Betsy goes shopping, she comes home, and something just didn't seem right. Sure enough, um, she got looking around and stuff was missing. And then she looked at the entrance door and it had been a, a monstrous crowbar and broke a lot of stuff as they opened that door. That's not what we're talking about, about opening doors to the gospel. God can open the door without breaking people. We don't have to break people. We just pray that God opens those doors. We pray for opportunities. God, as I go to work today, help there to be an opportunity to share my testimony, to share my faith, to share the gospel. And as we've been finding and hearing testimonies of in Sunday school, when we think that way and pray that way as we're in the car going to work, it's amazing the opportunities that we see. 
Um, the illustration that was given is, let's say you're praying about buying a new car and you're looking for a white van. As you're driving down the road, looking at the dealerships, there's white vans everywhere. And if you're praying for opportunities to share the gospel, you will find a lot of those opportunities. So pray for God's will, and God's will is to save people. So we're praying within God's will as we say, God, give me opportunities today to share the gospel. Pray that you would be working in those hearts right now to prepare them for me to come. And then pray for more workers, pray for clarity, pray for boldness, pray for opportunities. But all of this weaves together in praying for God's lost sheep, praying for the lost. How do we pray for the lost? And here again, we're, we're having to work on principle, not necessarily a clear passage of scripture that says, pray this, 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 and this for the lost. Why, and I'm just saying why and how, or why do we pray and what do we pray for the lost? Why do we pray? Because of their condition. Um, I do a fair amount of hospital calling. I go into the hospital and I see some of you sometimes in miserable condition. And I said, man, I can't help them. I can't help them. And, and, it, and it forces me at that moment to say, could I pray for you? And we pray. We pray because of their condition. What is their condition? They're blind. The God of this age has blinded them. They can't see. They're captive to Satan. They have been taken captive by him at his will, 2 Timothy says. They're condemned. Um, John 3, we, we like quoting ch chapter 3, verse 16, but just a couple of verses later, verse 18, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever doesn't believe is already condemned. They are condemned men, and their only hope is to be rescued through the gospel. They're spiritually dead. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. They're deserving God's wrath, and we saw this in Romans chapter 1 a few weeks ago. They're helpless. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Uh, it, they're not like cats. You call the cat, it says, if I feel like it. Right. And then you, the cat waits until the most inopportune time when you're eating supper, and that's when they want the attention. No, the lost people are helpless. They can't come. The Lord has to work, so we pray. They're hopeless. They were without hope. They were without God in this world. Can you imagine going through this life and life's problems without God helping you? And then without understanding. The man without the Spirit doesn't accept the things from the Spirit of God. Neither can he because they're spiritually discerned. We could go a whole sermon on each one of these verses, each one of these thoughts, but taken together, the lost person is in a desperate condition. Think of the person in intensive care who is, who is in serious, critical condition. We don't know if they're going to make it or not. So we pray, God, they need your help. They are blind, but they think they can see. They are dead and think they're alive. They're captive and think they're free. They're helpless and think they can do anything they want to do. They're without understanding and think they know everything. They will argue and argue and argue because they think they've got it all figured out. They're headed for hell and they think they're going to heaven. What a sad state of the lost people are in. So we pray. That's why we pray, but how do we pray? We, we pray, as we've already talked about, for a person to go and share the gospel with them. And as we continue praying in those directions, sometimes we're not available. Sometimes we're across the country from them. Sometimes we can send them a card or a tract, but God has somebody to go face to face to share the gospel with them. So we pray, but then we pray for the lost that God would open their heart 
that God would change their hearts. We pray that God would open their spiritually blind eyes. Paul, as he was giving his testimony about how God had called him to share the gospel, this is in Acts chapter 26, Paul said that I am, Jesus told Paul, I am sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. In order to receive forgiveness of sins, God has to open their eyes. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Last, because if God, if, if God opened their eyes, then they would come and see the glorious gospel, so Satan blinds them. So pray that God would open their eyes. Also pray that God would free them from the devil's enslavement. They are slaves to the devil. They're taken captive by him at his will. It is amazing that that the lost people look at us and they think, man, I'd hate to live in, in that rigid fence of rules they live within. They, they don't know the half of it, do they? They don't know the freedom of living. Lives have been changed through the gospel. I was listening to one person yesterday on a podcast who was debating an atheist in one of the, the atheist arguments was that women who are Christians are squashed and devalued. And this was a two-day debate. And in the middle of, of this time, so Friday night, the debate got over and then they went to supper with, with where there was this big gathering of Christians. And this guy goes in and he's looking around and he says, man, I've never seen so many beautiful women in my life. And I come from Hollywood. But what was he seeing? He was seeing joyful women who had been freed from Satan's enslavement. And men who, who could lead their wives lovingly because they, they weren't cracking the whip for their wives. They were loving them and leading them. Pray that God would free them from Satan's enslavement. Well, how else do we pray for them? Pray that they would recognize that they're lost. Okay, here's where the wives poke their husbands in, in the ribs. You never stop and ask for directions. Okay, so, so just think about lost people. It takes humility to stop and ask for directions, especially when you have Google Maps. Why would you want to stop and ask anybody? I have all the answers, thank you. It's right here on my phone. Pray that they would stop and, and think and recognize how lost they really are. God can show that to them. Pray that God would soften their hard heart. Ezekiel chapter 36 start, talks about this heart of stone I think we can picture people like this who have hearts of stone, hard-hearted, and God says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Pray that God would do this. And then one last little thing. This, I think, is probably as crucial as anything. If you ask somebody, Will, will you go to heaven when you die? Well, I hope so. Well, why would God let you in? Well, I've been a good person. I've been better than the next person. I've, I've done this. I've done that. I've done the other. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, remember in 10, 1, he said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. In verse 3, he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. The point is, pray that they would recognize that their righteousness is never going to be enough. Uh, one of the illustrations that we sometimes see given is, is the big canyon. So on this side is, is our human life, and on this side is heaven in all of its glories. But the canyon is this gulf 
between us that is our sin. And, and the Olympic runner can get running like crazy and jump, and he will make it maybe 20 or 30 feet out. And then pastor, he can run, he can make it maybe 15 feet out. And then some of you might be able to get five feet out. I don't know. But you think about that as it relates to our righteousness. There are some people that are more righteous than others, humanly speaking. In other words, we look at their lives and we say, you know, they are really nice people. But niceness does not ever go far enough. And, and that's where we see the picture of the cross being laid down across as the bridge that we go across. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the cross gets laid across that, and we trust the cross, and we go into heaven because our righteousness will never be enough. And one of the prayers that we can pray for lost people is that they recognize how short they fall from God's glory, that their righteousness will never be enough. So if you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus alone to save you. You're still trusting in how fast you can run spiritually, how much you can do spiritually. We're praying that you will see your need for the gospel. Jesus had to come and die for us because we would never be enough. We've all fallen short of God's perfection, his holiness. That's called sin. So God in his love sent Jesus to die in our place to take our punishment for us. He didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. But he died for us. Then he was resurrected in victory the third day. He's now sitting at his father's right hand and we come to him and we say, God, I have sinned against you. I don't deserve anything from you. I don't deserve to be with you. I don't deserve for you to even look at me. But I believe that Jesus died in my place. And the Father looks over at Jesus, and Jesus does this. He says, yes, I died for them. And God saves us. Pray for the lost. But believer, how do you see the lost? Do you see the lost as needing God's grace, or do you see the lost as deserving God's judgment? I mean, both are true, but do you have God's heart for the lost? God's heart that says, I am going to show them kindness by sending and sacrificing so that they could come to me, so they could be forgiven. Have you absorbed God's heart? How do you absorb somebody's heart? By spending time with them, by listening to them, but by, by just absorbing, marinating in all that they are. So the people you work with, you start becoming like, you start acting like them and talking like them because you've been spending time with them. I, I urge you, believer, to spend time with the Lord, get his heart, for the lost and then pray pray that God would prepare hearts your heart and the hearts of the lost that God would supply workers that worker could be you and it may be somebody else as well you may share the gospel initially and somebody else may come and reap the fruit that's okay God is the one who does it pray for the lost people that God would open their eyes and their hearts and then pray that you would have boldness and clarity and open doors to share the gospel with people around you. So that's how to pray for gospel outreach. Let's take our hymnals as we finish up. Another song really about God's love and his heart for the lost, hymn number 108. Hymn number 108, The Love of God. We'll sing just the first verse of this. Let's stand as we sing 108. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pen.
never trusted Christ, we invite you, he invites you today. His heart is to save you. And it's only through Jesus. Nothing that we can do. Believer, are you caring for the people around you? Are you looking for opportunities? Are you praying for those opportunities? I urge you to do so this morning. Father, we pray that as we go home, that we would have opportunities to share the gospel. That people would come in our way, either the end of the driveway or at the store or down the hallway in the apartment building, that there would be opportunities to share Christ. And sometimes, Lord, you put us in situations where we don't even think about sharing the gospel. Some of us may have to go to the doctor this week. We may have to go to the hospital this week. We may have to stand in line or sit in line at the motor vehicle department or something like that. And Lord, I pray we take those opportunities to look for ways to share the gospel as well. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.